I was born into a extremely devout Catholic family. My father had eight sisters and three brothers. Um, so I started out as young as I can remember in mass. Uh, anytime the, the, on Sunday, anytime there was mass, we were there. I remember starting out at, uh, when we moved here to the central Florida area, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas Church, believe it or not, was there way, way back in the day when I was a little bitty kid. And I remember serving as an altar boy at St. Thomas Aquinas Church as a little kid. And I was there, and my brother and I, we were serving Father Fabian. I even remember my dad and I, we used to do concrete work around the church and for Father Fabian at his house, like across the street. And we were literally, like, entrenched within the Catholic Church. And then I remember, you know, it, we had this routine where if we would go, because back in the day, uh, you used to be able to know your, your neighbors and, and what people were like a little bit better, maybe so, more so now than th today. And we used to go and spend the night at our friend's house a whole lot more than uh, I'm okay with my kids doing uh, in this world that we live in. But we would be at different people's houses all the time after Little League games. They actually used to have those on Saturdays. They didn't do this sleep t deprivation experiment that they do now where they try to see if you can stay up till 10 o'clock for multiple months on end and still survive. Uh, we used to actually have games on Saturdays and we would have games on Saturdays and go and spend time at our friend's house. But we had a routine within our house. That on Sunday morning, my dad would pull in very early. He would have our change of clothes because he knew we were either wearing all their clothes and, or we just had our baseball clothes, but he would have our church clothes ready. We would get dressed for church, and then off to Mass we went. But we went to this friend's house of ours that were on a baseball team with us, and they also were going to go to church. It wasn't the Catholic church, but they were going to go to church. And so my brothers and I, we were having so much fun, and we were like, well, let's call dad and mom and see if they'll let us go to church with them, and we'll try this out. Well, my mom was not a devout Catholic, so I don't know if that's what swung the pendulum or not, but, but we tried to convince, and finally we convinced our dad, like, hey, can we just go to church with them? So we wake up the next morning, and everybody's getting ready, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking, what kind of church are we going to? Because these people are looking for Bibles for everybody. And they, you know, back in the day, you remember, maybe you still have my wife, but you remember like you had the Bible carriers and they were like leather and they had all your name. Like, so they all had all these like, and then they're like looking around and different things. And like, I think I had one that was like that thick. I don't know. But we all ended up going to church with the Bible. And I remember walking into First Christian Church at Kissimmee, and we walked down this little bitty hallway, and we're there early for Sunday school, right? And so we walk into this room where it's the fourth and fifth grade boys, which whose idea was that, right? <laughs> to, stick, to stick a bunch of fourth and fifth grade boys when they all invite their friends over the night before, and you're preparing for a class of five, and next thing you know, you've got ten, Right? And they just stayed up all night because nobody could sleep. And they're in this room together. And now you're trying to mitigate chaos. And all of a sudden, they ask us to open our Bibles. I have no idea where we're going, but I find my way into the story. And chaos is going on in the room. And all of a sudden, I remember. I remember being nine. And for the first time in my life, I was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and I was listening. I was not listening to my friend Gibbs Chapman stutter through the story of Jonah and what was happening inside this big fish. All I know is at nine years old, I remember sitting there saying, this is alive and real, and I want to be here. I have never heard this before in my life, but I want to be here. And I remember leaving that Sunday morning and coming home to my parents, and it was this excitement, but at the same time, it was the reality that we had commitments, we had distractions, and we had obligations. My brother and I, I think it was our next month to serve as altar boys, we had all these obligations. And I remember telling my parents, I remember telling my dad, you guys can go back there, but I want to go there. 
Like, I want to go back there. And I remember trying to choose, like, that's where I want to be in my life. I want to be right there because something happened there. I felt like I encountered the, 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 the creator of the universe in that place, and I want to be there. Through God's miraculous intervention, my family and I, we, we actually switched and we actually went. I, I, I just threw away yesterday because I was cleaning up some stuff. I don't remember when it got sent to me, but I think it was from like one of my aunts or I don't know how it came about because they were all Catholic. But, but literally yesterday I was looking through and I had my birth certificate of, or my, my, uh, my baptismal certificate that of when I was baptized into a Catholic church sometime in January of 1981 because I got baptized as an infant within the Catholic church, right? Like that, but I did not realize that for the rest of my life, getting back to that place that I had encountered in that room at nine was going to be a lifelong struggle. That it was going to be a place that I wanted to be, but that everything about life was going to try to keep me away from being there. Have you ever, have you ever found that to be a, a struggle for you in your life? I mean, that, this to me is one of the most uncomfortable sermons that I think, I've, I've preached a lot of difficult sermons in my life, but this one for me is uncomfortable because this is the real struggle for me. It's, it's a life of where I want to be, but a life that is constantly trying to take me away from being right there. It, it, I, I relate well to this story. It's a story in the Bible we're going to look at. It's, it, it's a woman named Martha, a sister named Mary, and it's an interaction with the God of the universe who walked on this earth, Jesus. Martha is going to invite him into her house. Jesus was invited into many houses, if you know, throughout the story of the Gospels of his life. Many times it was to trial and to test him, to see if we can catch him into something, to see if he can slip up so that we can accuse him of being the crazy lunatic that we think he is to turn the people against him. But that is not at all why Martha wanted him to come into his house. Martha knew there was something special about him, that, that there was a reason that she wanted him to come into her house. And so she invites him in. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. And this is what the text says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You see, my life, I want to be Mary, but I find myself living in a Martha world. It's, it's a Martha world where there's constantly distractions, there's constantly stuff that needs to be done, there's constantly tasks that are, that are like vying for my attention. I, my, my wife's going to say something later, but I, I'm terrible at naming sermons, so if, if you're one of the people that follow along, and that, you're like, what is he, why would he name this about M&Ms? Like, what's the point of that? Like, the, it's, it's Mary and Martha, but it's also the struggle of my life. It's managed or margins, right? And that's pretty much what our lives are. We're either managed by our life or we intentionally choose to have margins in our life. 
You see, manage, if you look it up, manage is control to control or organize someone or something. If you ever feel like this world does that to you, raise your hand. My hand goes up, right? Yeah, I mean, to, to, to be controlled or organized someone or something. My schedule, my work, my finances. My, I mean, I, I would love to sit up here and tell you, you know what? From nine years old on, once I decided to, to make that commitment to following Jesus, everything was great. And then, you know, everything in the BC years of my life, which you could before chaos, before kids, before children, whichever one you want to you you make that BC. But, but it, that's not true because I started thinking about it and I wanted to tell you guys, I, I'm driving down Narcusi Road the other day to go to the airport. And my heart was broken. Not because of the traffic, right? Not because they're, they're building another apartment complex with another entranceway out that somehow has no light and they're going to fly across and try to get across all those lanes of traffic somehow. That's not why they were tearing out more of my work. I built that road. I had sleepless nights building that beautiful curb that goes all the way down the side of that to create more and more lanes of traffic for you. I built that sidewalk. They went all the way down it, and it was so nice. The inspectors would come out and check it, and I don't know how many times I could not sleep at night because I was pouring the concrete in my head, and I would wake up exhausted, and I would go out there exhausted, and I would put so much pride and energy into my work, and I was doing the work, and I drive down the road the other day, and you don't even care. You drive by it every day. Many of you go through harmony and you have no idea. I did all of the concrete in here. Don't blame me. I did not put the oak trees that get bigger <laughs> right behind the curb. I did the curb. I did the sidewalk and some brilliant guy decided three foot of grass is enough room to put a tree that's going to grow three foot wide and it's going to destroy everything. It's exactly what they did. And so you go through here and they destroy all my work. Because at the end of the day, guess what? It's temporary. But I don't know how many times it managed me. I wanted to wake up early in the morning because that was the time, the best time that I could find, that I could have that margin in my life to sit at the feet of Jesus. And I don't know what it is, but the things that I had to do that day would pop up and they would pull me away. The distractions, the things that I have to do, the schedule, the demands, the obligations, constantly pulling. I want you to notice something here. Mary, it, it, it's an interesting contrast, right? Mary is listening to the God of the universe. Martha is telling the God of the universe that she should be over here being like me. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't get on to Martha. Did you notice? I mean, maybe, maybe in my head sometimes, maybe I hear God say, he, he, you know, like I'm here. But that's not, how he's, that's not how he says anything to Martha. He doesn't scold her. He's not upset with her. He's actually very kind to Martha. Because Martha's actually doing what Jesus got on to many people for not doing to him when he came into their home. Do you remember when he would go into the Pharisee's home and he's like, you didn't even, you didn't offer me any hospitality whatsoever. You, you didn't, and yet Martha is there trying to offer Jesus hospitality. She's not doing a bad thing. She's actually doing what she was supposed to be doing as the person that invited Jesus into the house. But the problem is, 
is that she is being consumed by those things and missing who is in her home. So she, it's all these distractions. And so Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only, how many things? Only one thing is needed. I, I heard a story. I don't know if it's true or not. It, it sounds like a cool experiment. And if you've ever heard me and you know me well enough, I like to tell stories that I exaggerate on them quite a bit. So just give me the liberty to exaggerate on this one because I think there's truth to it. Supposedly there's a story about a family where, where, where the dad and the mom decided they were going to let their kids have sticky notes. And they were going to give them sticky notes. And the goal of the game was to put a sticky note with a T on anything in their house that was temporary. And so the kids were having fun with this, right? So they're going around and they're putting sticky notes on all the stuff. But all of a sudden, they started putting sticky notes on stuff that was like really important to them. And it was like the TV, like temporary. I, I actually started to think through this morning. I was like, you know, it'd be a fun experiment. If you did that with your kids and you were like, okay, whatever gets a T, we can't touch because it's temporary, right? And then when they put one on your phone, no, I mean, actually, it would be you putting it on, you putting it on their phone, right? Because we're not, we're not consumed by our phones at all, but, right? but like, you put it on your phone, you put it on, all of a sudden, guess what? Start to think about it. It's actually a crazy experiment. There's only, back to Jesus' words, there's, there's really only one thing that doesn't get a T, and you've got to put it on the family members that are playing the game with you. And yet, what is it at our house, at our jobs, in our lives that literally consume all of our time and all of our energy? It's the same thing that Jesus is saying to Martha. Martha, Martha, all those things, they're consuming you, but only one thing really, only one thing really matters. And here's the crazy thing about that one thing. Mary has chosen, it says in verse 42, Mary has chosen what is better. And get this, it will what? It will not be taken away from her. You know, I, I wish I could tell you that I know how to apply this sermon. I wish I could tell you, here's what you, here's what you need to do, right? That, like, that's the... This is a sermon that makes me very uncomfortable because I, I want to have the Mary type margin in my life to where I'm seated at the feet of Jesus and I've got all of the noise around me because it doesn't stop. Like, I want you to put yourself in Mary. Do you think Mary doesn't know that Martha's right next in the other room? Like, Houses aren't like ours, right, where you got to go through. Like the homes were open to where she knows exactly what Martha's doing. She's making noise in there as she's trying to make the salad and set the table and get everything ready because she has Jesus in her home. Mary hears all the noise. It's not that it's not there that she's not distracted. It's that what? She chooses to be right here and not let anything take her attention away from her time with Jesus. I wish I knew how to do that in my life. Some of you, some of you, that is, that is a gift that God has given you. Like you, you do the Mary side very well. 
Don't let the Marthas like me tell you to come and do what I'm doing. Like, whether it be in the church, whether, like, right? Whether it be anywhere. Like, I mean, think about it. Think of what happened in the church in the, in the book of Acts. Right? The disciples, they were doing all this stuff, and they're getting busy, and they're serving all the widows. And finally, the disciples get together, and they're like, we got to get help for that because we are neglecting the word of God to serve tables, right? Like, we have to make sure that we don't get busy with the Martha task and neglect the Mary stuff. But it can happen in churches. It happens when you're serving. There's no one that is immune from it. We can be doing some of the greatest, most God-honoring tasks in the world, and at the end of the day, we can miss why we're doing them and that they're fostered out of a deep-seated relationship with the God of the universe. And ultimately, all they become are tasks and jobs and obligations and commitments. I mean, Jesus wasn't talking to a fictitious church in Revelation chapter 2 when he spoke to the church in Ephesus. If you know anything about the church in Ephesus, he commends them. You're working hard. You're persevering. Your, your task, your deeds, you're doing all of these incredible things. He doesn't get on to them because they're not doing work. He gets on to them because of one thing. You know what he says to them? You forgot your first love. He's saying even, even in ministry, even in the church, you can busy yourself with the things of God. And in the midst of your busyness, that can become your worship that manages you. And at the end of the day, you don't have the margins to be seated at the feet of the God of the universe and let him fill you. I mean, do you, th I, I went to Bible college. I went and did all the seminary stuff. I know guys that, that were devoted to the Lord. And I have watched them fall left and right out of ministry. It's not because they didn't love God. I, I sat in classes with them. It's because the distractions and the noise get to them. The seeds that fell along the path. It's not that they didn't want to grow. It's that the worries and the toil of the life drowned them out. It, it's not that we're here because we just want to attend church. It's not that we're, we're here because we want Martha. And maybe for some of us, it's like you're like me. You don't want those Martha times to just be memories. You want them to be an actual rhythm of your life. Not moments. Not memories. Not... They, they happen on spiritual high sometimes when we have those retreats or we go on different things and it's because we made the margin for it, but life wants to squeeze it out of us. And life wants to manage that time away from it. And so the challenge for all of us, the challenge for all of us is to hear Jesus' loving conversation with Martha. How do I know it's loving? How do you? Jesus, our brother Lazarus is dead, and had you been here, he wouldn't have died. As Martha ran out to see Jesus and meet him before he made it to her home, Jesus raises her brother Lazarus from the dead. When he raises Lazarus from the dead and they're having the meal in Mary's house again in John chapter 12. Mary, who in our story was seated at the feet of Jesus listening. Mary takes an expensive jar of perfume and she breaks it. And she anoints the feet of Jesus with the oil and she washes it with her hair. While Martha is in the home serving. Did you hear it? 
She's serving here. But her serving was consuming her with the temporary distractions. What is it that happens to where Jesus doesn't say, Martha, what are you doing in the kitchen again? Mary's back at my feet again. She's washing them with, with oil, preparing my body for the sacrifice that I'm about to make, and I'm about to die, and Martha, you're back in there serving again. No, because Martha's heart had been transformed to where her serving was now worship. And so for some of us, it's not that we need to stop serving. We not, it's not that we need to stop doing all that stuff. It's that we need to make sure that we have the margins in our life, that they're filled with Mary-type moments. So that while we serve, while we live, we're not being managed by our schedule. Our schedule, our tasks, all of those things have what? An eternal purpose. Because at the end of the day, only one thing is needed. I don't know what the application is for you. Maybe you need to hear Jesus say your name like I need him to hear mine all the time. Instead of it being Martha, Martha, let it be your name. Let it be your name where the God of the universe is calling you to stop being distracted by so many different things. He doesn't need you to be an employee. He doesn't need you to be a plumber. He doesn't need you to be a teacher. He doesn't, he doesn't need you to be, you name it all, mom, dad, whatever. What he needs you to be is his son or daughter. My prayer for you is a prayer for me that in my life, when the Martha tasks start to consume me, that I'll see Mary sitting over there saying, I want to be there and know that the God of the universe also wants you to be there. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we get asked all the time, it's the number one question that I get asked and I probably ask other people. When you want to talk about work or life or anything, it's, it's are, are you staying busy? God, we're a busy people. Tasks aren't going to stop today. Tasks aren't going to stop tomorrow. We all have stuff to do. But God, at the end of the day, help us to help us to do like you did and or you told your stories and parables where a man found a treasure in a field and it was so valuable that he sold everything else that he had because he had to have that one treasure. The guy found an expensive pearl, the, the, the greatest pearl and he sold everything else that he had so that he could have that one thing. God, help us. Help us to have that type of passion for being a people of your kingdom. To where all the other things of this kingdom of this world that we live in, that they will just be that. They will just be things of this kingdom. That we will not allow them to rob us, to steal from us, to, to take us away from being children in the kingdom that you have called us to through the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. Because there is where we worship. There is where we meet you. There is where we are filled with an eternal food. God, help us as we struggle in this, and maybe it's just me. 
But I think there's more of us that struggle, God. Would you help us in this struggle? We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.